गुड आफ्टरनून वन एंड ऑल दिस इज डॉक्टर पूर्व देसाई डीन फैकल्टी ऑफ होम्योपैथी पारोल यूनिवर्सिटी एंड प्रिंसिपल ऑफ जवाहरलाल नेहरू होम्योपैथिक मेडिकल कॉलेज प्लीज टू शेयर यू दैट द फैकल्टी ऑफ होम्योपैथी कुड ऑर्गेनाइज ट्वेंटी फाइव सक्सेसफुल वेबिनार्स एंड नाउ कमिंग टू यू विद्वेंटी सिक्स वन on behalf of faculty of homeopathy i heartily welcome you all in the great journey of webinars at parul university there are various faculties all are regularly conducting the various webinars they are calling the expert speakers from their domain we the faculty of homeopathy are equally contributing in this once again we will bring to you the most exciting webinar series we are very happy for uh your wonderful gestures of attending our webinars on an average we are observing more than 1500 viewers in each and every webinars which is really an extraordinary achievements we are also assuring you that we will bring to you the worthy speakers throughout the series which can enrich your knowledge in the field of homeopathy uh, we have our president uh, dr devansu patel sir uh, the energetic uh, director dr dr komar patel madam and the vibrant team of parol university officials they are constantly supporting us to conduct this kind of vibrant activity our team has four principals of four constituent colleges of parol university i am dr purav desai heading jnhmc uh, we have dr hina rawal from amdavad homeopathic medical college dr hitat mehta from rajkot homeopathic medical college and dr bp panda sir from parol institute of homeopathy and research today we have dr jagos as a speaker of today's webinar and i request dr hina madam to brief the introduction of him uh, dr hina rawal is a principal of amdavad homeopathic medical professor in department of organo of medicine chairman of board of studies parul university former cch member and approved nabh as well as nac assessor i request her to proceed uh, further uh, over to dr hina madam thank you dr purav sir it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce jagos sir dr jagos is an md in homeopathy hmd uk md am he is a consultant homeopathic physician in south mumbai and practicing since 32 years he practices hanumanian homeopathy according to the principles laid down in ordinal of medicine he was the only indian homeopathic doctor to receive a travel scholarship award from the Maui Academy of Homeopathy Hawaii USA in 1992 to pursue an advanced training homeopathic workshop program in the same year he underwent additional training in homeopathy from the London College of Classical Homeopathy under the guided guidance of late Dr Amy Larkin he is attached to Dr Rivai Patel Homeopathic Medical College Pimpri Pune as professor in department of organon and homeopathic philosophy and has a total teaching experience of 31 years he has presented many scientific papers at both national and international conferences and has to his credit over 70 publications of scientific articles in eminent homeopathic journals he has also published five research papers which have been published in reputed peer reviewed journal sir is the author of the book homeopathic world which is recognized book by maharashtra university of health sciences for both graduate and post graduate students his recent book on an insight into tubercular miasm is also very popular his latest book on miasms is under publication he has also introduced new drugs in homeopathy and is actively participating in research work He has been an examiner for diploma degree and postgraduate courses in homeopathy attached to various universities of Mumbai, Nashik, Goa, Aurangabad, Jalgaon, Odisha, Bangalore and Vijayawada. He is also an examiner of Cyber Jaya University of Medical Sciences Malaysia since March 2019. He is an approved guide for postgraduate and doctorate study in homeopathy by the Central Council of Homeopathy. He is appointed as inspector by CCH and chairman for local inquiry committee for inspection of homeopathic medical college in Maharashtra. He is a member of many societies of homeopathy and is representing of the editorial board of National Journal of Homeopathy. 
a well read journal in homeopathic circle sir is a honorary homeopathic physician attached to many allopathic hospitals in mumbai which runs an alternative medicine department namely masaina bd patrick parsi general hospital and nirbhaya hospital he is a consultant homeopathic doctor at tata capital finance services he runs special homeopathic clinics for the needy and poor people in different parts in mumbai he has many awards to his credit for his contribution in field of homeopathy one of his award was bharat ratna mother teresa gold medal award from gepra chennai in august 2017 his most recent award for his contribution to homeopathic field was recognized by the university of west london at the international homeopathic congress he was conferred with the star of homeopathy award in 2019 sir also has his youtube channel which is frequently viewed by many many learners of homeopathy it's my privilege to welcome dr jabbu sir please sir we can begin with your presentation welcome sir thank you very much dr hina raval madam i will now uh, make my presentation can can it be yes, seen yes yes sir okay good afternoon everybody it's my honor and privilege today to present before you the webinar on the topic evolution of disease in homeopathy and the manifestations of different expressions and its homeopathic management well i've taken this topic because it is an important topic to understand basically what is disease how it evolves so until and unless your foundations are strong then only you will be able to appreciate what is seen in practice so therefore let us see once we have understood the evolution of disease let us see how different expressions are there and how to manage them homeopathically so it is a important topic both for theory as well as for practical purposes so let us see what more it has in store for us today well just to just for a brief introduction disease in homeopathy are always dynamic in nature as you all know dr hanneman said that all the diseases in homeopathy are always dynamic in nature and he deviated from the old school which had a materialistic concept old school they thought of the the tollum causae or the prima causae morbi or the materia piccans and they failed to look beyond beyond that that is into the dynamic nature of the disease life is always a flow and it is never static so life is there in this world because of the universal vital force or the universal energy which is there because of that energy all the things which are living on the earth are thriving hence life is always a flow and it is never static as a result of life which is a flow disease also is in is, is in is in a continuous motion along with life along with that we also have another important aspect of susceptibility and it flows along with the life and disease so we have got life we have got disease and we have got susceptibility they all are moving in a constant flow susceptibility plays an important part in determining the sequential evolutionary march of events in the patient's life so this is very important you have to know the sequentially evolutionary march of events so for this importance is given to the different epochs in one's life so the important features in one's life you have to take into consideration for example the delivery how was the delivery or what was the mental status of the mother during delivery then what was the status of the of the of the neonate after delivery then from a neonate the the, the, the child go, i mean then we come to an infant infant stage from an infant stage we come to a child stage from a child stage we come to puberty from puberty we go to uh, the, the 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 teens from teens we come to adult adult we come to middle age and then come to old age and ultimately death so these are the all the important epochs in which we have to take into consideration and see if any diseases are there or not thus health is an equilibrium and it is maintained so in health basically we have 
all the harmonious functioning of all the physiological processes in our body going on. So therefore, equilibrium is maintained. In health, there is order along with all the other processes in our body. The order is maintained and harmony is also maintained. In contrast to disease, where the vital force is deranged and there is a disharmony or disequilibrium or disorder. So health and disease, they are both totally opposite. In health, there is harmony. In disease, there is disharmony. In health, there is equilibrium. In disease, there is disequilibrium. And in health, there is order. In disease, there is disorder. Therefore, homeostasis is not maintained and the internal milieu is in a chaotic state. So the word internal milieu was discovered by a French physiologist, Claude Bernard, in 1865. And the word homeostasis was coined by a Harvard psychologist, sorry, Harvard physiologist, Walter Bradford Cannon, in 1936. So homeostasis is maintained by the psychoneuroendocrine axis along with the PNE axis. So therefore, in health, homeostasis is maintained and in disease, the internal milieu is in a chaotic state. So after the brief introduction, now let us see in what way the disease will evolve or the evolution of the disease. So the first part of it is it evolves on the dynamic level also known as the preclinical or the pre-functional level. So at this level, can we find out that, that the person is not feeling well? Are there any instruments? Are there any ways? Are there any sort of investigations which we can do in order to find out the dynamic derangement of the vital force? Well, at this level, it is not possible for us to know that the vital force has been deranged dynamically because it is just the very beginning, just the very beginning of the derangement. However, if we go to the history of medicine, if we see during the Hippocratic's time, there were people who used to do dowsing, also known as Rajasthisa. So the person who used to do dowsing is known as a dowser. So he used to take a pendulum which is attached to a string and he used to say, uh, I mean, program the pendulum saying that a clockwise direction will be a positive result, anti-clockwise direction will be a negative result. So he would tell you exactly where to dig in which part or which area or in which geographical location to dig. As a result of which either you would get water or in the other, other area you would get oil. So a dowser would be able to find out whether there is water or whether there is oil in a particular location or a geographical area. However, if we still go further, then comes Carl Jung in 1906, he invented the psychometer. It's a device to measure the mental activity or the psychological activity of an individual. So this also may tell you the initial derangement of the vital force. As we go, as we go further into the advancement of science, we also get Krillian photography. Well, it was invented by a Soviet inventor Semyon Krillian in 1939. In this photography, the electromagnetic waves of a person are captured. So, a camera is there. Of course, this camera is very expensive. It, um, it starts from a minimum of uh, 5,000 US dollars to the maximum of 16,000 US dollars. That is around 3.5 lakhs to around 11.5 lakhs. So, I had the privilege of working with late Dr. Prakash Vakil, who had this camera and we had seen good results with this camera. So what, what does this camera do? We basically take the aura on a photographic plate of the tips of the fingers and the tips of the toes. Patient is kept in a dark room and a high voltage current is passed on the photographic paper and then it is developed with a photographic solution and, your, and you get certain patterns. Basically three patterns are there, the deficiency pattern, the toxic pattern and the degenerative pattern. So this will tell you exactly which organ or what location or what part of the body has been affected. It will not tell you the diagnosis, but it will at least give a clue to tell you that something is wrong with this part or this location or this system of the body. Then you can get yourself investigated and you, and you may find out that something is definitely wrong with them. So this is just the initial beginning of the disease whereby Krillian photography will pick up.
Not only that, this photography also helps us to determine the usefulness of a homeopathic remedy. When the patient comes to us, we take the Krillian photography, we see what pattern is there, we give the homeopathic medicine according to the symptom similarity and after a few days or few weeks, we again take the Krillian photography and we see that the pattern has completely changed and it has come back to normal. So this shows that our medicines act on the dynamic plane. So by Krillian photography also, we can come to know what changes take place initially on the dynamic level. Stay in today's world, we've got the aura scan. In Mumbai, I know a place, it is near the Grand Road Station, known as Pyramid Yoga Center, in which they have an aura scan. They scan your aura and the different chakras are there in your body. They tell you what is wrong with which chakra and how to modify it. So this is the level or this is, these are the ways or means by which we can identify the dynamic derangement of the vital force at the dynamic level. Otherwise, it is impossible to find out what is wrong with the person. So at the dynamic level, basically, we cannot identify except with these investigations. So from the dynamic level, then the disease will come into the functional level, also known as the prodromal stage in modern medicine or in homeopathy. We can also call it as an, as an indisposition. So at this level, the patient gets some symptoms and if you investigate the patient, however, the investigations will come normal. If the patient um, ignores his health and allows the disease to progress because he doesn't want any treatment or he thinks it is okay, he can manage it on by his own self, then it goes into a structural change, wherein definitely you will be able to identify the part, the location, the system or the organ involved and a definite diagnosis can be obtained because even the biochemical changes are totally abnormal. Still, if the patient ignores his state of health and carries, carries forward, then from a structural change, it will go into the, into, the, into the pathological change whereby pathology may be reversible or it may be irreversible. It depends on how long the patient has ignored his health. So in short, the change in state of an individual goes from the dynamic plane to the or the pre-functional plane, to the functional plane, to the structural plane and development of pathology. Pathology could be reversible in the early stages or irreversible in the later stages. Or the, or the disease may travel from the structural plane into complications into the sequelae also. So this is one aspect of how a disease a disease evolves. Second aspect is that the disease is evolved through the predisposition, disposition, diathesis, disease, expression and, and phases at different levels. Now let me explain to you what do I mean by this. So I made a chart out here in which you will see the predisposition, the disposition, diathesis, disease, expression, phases and the different levels are there. So just in short to tell you the importance of this is that the predisposition basically helps us to identify the fundamental miasm from the family history of the patient. The disposition, the synonyms are type, typology, constitution, they will, they are partly inherited but, but mostly they are acquired. So as the patient grows up, the, he will acquire certain traits. So the disposition will be how the patient looks, his stature, his build, and also how, and also symptoms on the mental level as well as on the physical level. So on disposition, the it will include the look of the patient as well as symptoms on the mental level as well as on the physical level. Then comes diathesis. This is just a theoretical uh, arbitrary point which has been included. As I go forward, I'll explain to you. Then the disease is there and the expressions are there, which goes from the skin, mucous membrane onwards to the more important organs. Then the different phases come, commonly seen acute phase, chronic phase, subacute, terminal, etc. And the different levels where the patient comes to us in our clinic. So basically, we see the patient in our clinic at this level, at this level. He may, he may exhibit any, any one of these phases, 
we have to identify what phase is it and how to manage that phase with homeopathy. So what do we do? When he comes to your clinic, we have to go upwards and see the expression, see the disposition, see the predisposition and evolve the full disease. So now let me go forward and let me tell you slightly more about this. So let us familiarize ourselves with the meanings of the different terms which are used in the evolution of the disease. Predisposition. Basically, it comes from a Latin word, pre meaning before, and dispone meaning put in order, arrange or distribute. So basically, the word predisposition in the English dictionary will mean that to think or act in a certain way, you can anticipate your reaction before it happens. That means what you are anticipating something which is going to happen so that you can become well prepared. For example, let us say you are traveling in a dark alley and you are alone and it is night time and you have a feeling that something is bad is going to happen and you anticipate something is going to happen. So basically you have a predisposition think something is going to happen. So this will make you, make you act in a particular way. So suppose a mugger comes or suppose a thief comes to attack you, then you are already prepared and you will definitely act in a very defensive manner. However, in the medical terms, it means predisposition will mean a genetic predisposition will mean that you are going to inherit traits from your parents. So as you all know, certain diseases are there which are pre prevalent in certain caste of people or in certain families hmm, like cancer or, or tuberculosis or hypertension, etc. So other examples can be also uh, diabetes, mellitus, thyroid disorders, etc. Then disposition. It means a person's inherent quality of mind and physical character. The synonyms are temperament, character, personality, nature, type, typology and constitution. As I told you before, it is partly inherited, but it is, it is mainly acquired. Inherited through the predisposition that is evident through the family history and the past history that is the inherited diseases. So it is partly inherited, but mainly majority it is acquired. Acquired how? Through the person's walk in life and according the person will develop good or bad qualities or the traits. So it depends basically on how you are brought up in life, how your parents train you, what sanskar they have given you, etc. So if they have trained you well, you will definitely go on the good path of life and you will have left disease, you will have left less diseases as compared to those parents who do not treat, train their children or who are not bothered or who have no time for their children, as a result of which the children develop bad qualities and they are more prone to the different diseases. Therefore, in indisposition, therefore, in disposition, we will take into consideration the appearance of the patient, the mental makeup, and the physical gender characteristics. Now, diathesis. As I told you, diathesis is just a theoretical uh, word which, which I have put up in the chart. It is not seen in practice. So now let us see what do we mean by the word diathesis. As per the International Dictionary of Homeopathy 2000, it has been defined as a pattern of disordered characteristics of an underlying disease trait. So basically, a disease trait will be there as a result of which the person may be prone to that type of disease. This trait is got from the fundamental miasm and there are certain qualities which we, which we call as diathesis. So it may be regarded as a predisposition to a particular lyme disease and disease is developed due to exaggerated response to the environmental factors. So as you all know that we are constantly bombarded by the environment. The environmental factors are physical factors, chemical factors, biological factors and the psychosocial cultural factors. So we are constantly bombarded by these factors. Well, if you see Dr. L. M. M. L. Dhavale's opinion, he says diathesis represents certain deviations in susceptibility which is not sufficiently marked to merit the label of disease and in which the response to environment stimulus tends to be exaggerated or erratic. It can also be defined as the state or condition of the body or a combination of attributes in an individual causing a susceptibility to the disease. As I told you, 
that this diathesis is obtained from the fundamental miasm or from the trait of the fundamental miasm. Say for example, if the fundamental miasm is tubercular, the traits of the tubercular miasm will be recurrent tendency to catch cold, extremely sensitive to cold, has never been well since the disease, erraticity, changeability, so on and so forth. So the patient, basically you cannot diagnose any disease name, but there will be certain traits which will tell you in the future what probable diseases the patient may develop. Another example is psychosis or psychotic diathesis is a tendency to retain water and tissues, to produce small cutaneous fig-like tumors, chronic attack of mucous membrane, and also slow progress development of disease and other symptoms. So it is a phase of precarious balance in which a slight push is sufficient to topple down the system into a slippery inclined plane of disease leading to final destruction. So therefore, it is a delicate balance and it can be compared to a seesaw in which equilibrium is, meant, is uh, required to maintain the balance. So basically, you can compare it to a seesaw, two sides are there, it has to be balanced. However, if one side goes down, the patient will go into a disease state and the probable diathesis will appear. So therefore, now if you are confused to what I have told regarding diathesis, just remember in simple terms, it is a borderline state between normality and abnormality or it's a, it, is a, it is a borderline state between normal susceptibility and the disease condition. So it's a very delicate balance between the normal susceptibility and the disease condition which can be compared to a seesaw. The fulcrum is in the center and at two, both the ends have to be balanced by the susceptibility. If the environmental factors acting on it, they will push the seesaw either on the right side or on the left side and the disease condition will come inside. Now, just let us know something about in general what we mean by disease. The word disease means lack of ease, not at ease or absence of ease. It is the disordered functioning of the vital force which is evident through signs and symptoms. So naturally, whatever expressions are there, it is because of the vital force which has been deranged. It tells us about the earliest changes in the development of the disease. So expressions are the earliest, earliest signs or symptoms which will tell you that a disease is being evolved in your body. At this stage, the process of localization has not begun and therefore we are still unable to determine which particular tissue, system or organ is going to be affected. So in the initial stage, when it's in the functional sphere, again it is difficult to determine what system part or location has been affected. Hence initially the harmonious functioning of the life force is reflected in our feelings of uneasiness. Now expressions, it means something that manifests or symbolizes as seen through signs and symptoms. It includes the phases and different levels of expression. Now phases, it means the different pattern of disease manifestation. So commonly, if you see in our organ on textbook, the two in practice we see the two common phases are the acute phase or the chronic phase. However, different phases are given in the organ on book, which we shall take up later as we proceed further. So different phases are given like acute, chronic, subacute, terminal, one-sided, lopsided, alternating disease, intermittent disease, relapsing disease, and so on and so forth. So we'll see all that later on. Now, different levels of expression. It means the different ways that disease can be presented to a homeopathic physician. It starts right from the functional disorders and may end up to be a culminating disease. So right from the basic beginning of the disease, that is a functional disorder, to a full-flown bledge or full-fledged full disease which requires urgent attention, that is a fulminating disease. So let us see all these different levels of expression, which I will take later on. The observant homeopathy physician must accurately perceive in which phase the patient exhibits its symptoms. So you have to know in which phase or in which level the symptoms are accordingly the management will differ. Each phase will have a different plan of treatment. Selection of the phasic remedy depends upon the phase of the disease expressed. The third way of, of uh, attributing the evolution of disease is how does the disease evolve? It evolves centrifugally. That means what? The disease has its origin 
from within that means what it 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 starts from the center and goes to the periphery therefore it is centrifugal miasms are responsible for the disease to develop for both acute as well as chronic disease in acute disease the acute miasms recurring and non recurring which you all know which you all know about and also the exciting cause has to be taken into consideration and in the chronic disease naturally you have to take the fundamental cause in the form of the chronic miasm so the disease will evolve from within outwards now expression let us see how an expression evolves it evolves just in the opposite direction that is the centripetal evolution it means that the disease will first express itself from the skin then it slightly go inwards to the mucous membranes to the serous membranes and vital organs which are last to be affected in other words the disease travels from the less important organs to the more important organs or from periphery to center or from the skin to the mucous membrane so let us recap the flow chart that will describe all these terms with respect to the evolution of the disease so just to recap again i have given this flow chart and i have explained all the all the points in detail okay so now in practice as i told you we see the peep, we see the person at this level right from the functional disturbance to the acute fulminating disease and all these points now will be taken into consideration and let us see how we can manage them homeopathically so physician sees the patient at various levels number 1 the functional changes which is the most common it indicates the early manifestation of disease naturally there's no tissue change all the investigations are normal there's no pathology and you will know that 100% cure will take place so in such cases it is easy for us to identify the homeopathic medicine and administer it to the patient and the patient will get all right within a few days in the structural changes the disease has progressed from the functional plane to the structural plane with characteristic expression of the disease so now now the expression as i have written here will be characteristic now that will depend upon the state of susceptibility if the patient hasn't taken any suppressive treatment in the past or is come to you in, for the first time for a first consulting without without meeting any other doctors or maybe that he has seen two three other allopathic doctors he wasn't satisfied with them and so he has come to you and luckily the susceptibility has not been hampered the susceptibility is still good and the body is throwing out pqrs or characteristic symptoms so therefore in the structural changes we have to see what changes occur in the tissue what organ is affected what is the location or what system is involved and again biochemical investigations are abnormal and specialized investigations pinpoint to the organ or the system affected so in such instances also if you are lucky if a structural change has taken place you will be able to also cure it properly provided the structural changes are reversible so in a structural change the diagnosis is definite and the pathology if you are lucky patient may come to you in an early stage where it is reversible or he may come to in the into a later stage where it is irreversible so if it is reversible cure can be achieved if it is irreversible you can explain to the patient that you will be able to palliate the patient that is give only temporary relief to the patient without much affecting the state of susceptibility now secondary changes so as the disease advances and if left to progress on its own or if improper treatment is given then this stage will become prominent so as i told you if the person ignores himself he gets some symptoms like not feeling well lack of appetite scary dreams so this comes in the functional plane then he comes to the structural plane that he is not feeling well he is getting pain in the right hypochondrium and he sees his sclera becomes yellow there is nausea there is vomiting maybe maybe fever and so on and so forth okay so the then the person will still ignore himself and it may still the disease may still progress and complications may occur 
So pathology may be reversible, irreversible, or it may be at the borderline stage. Borderline stage is what? Between the stage of reversibility and irreversibility. You are not sure whether you will be able to reverse the condition or not, but it is worth a try. Many a times we have seen in practice when people are coming at the borderline stage, giving the right homeopathic remedy, the patient again comes back to a healthy state in which the pathology becomes reversible. So chances of cure are grim if the disease has advanced to a gross organ damage or if it's on a borderline aspect. So as I told you in a borderline aspect, you, you have to try your luck to see whether it is reversible or irreversible by giving the indicated homeopathic remedy according to symptom similarity. However, if a gross organ has been damaged, then naturally you, you cannot do anything except you can, you can arrest the disease process and you will be able to give some sort of an palliation to the patient. At the miasmatic level, the disease will be prominent with its miasmatic interpretation at one point in time. The correct miasm phase must be diagnosed and remember that one miasm is permanent at a point in time. So at the miasmatic phase, we have to identify exactly what is the miasm. So as you all know that all the diseases are multi-miasmatic in nature. Similarly, all the drugs which you have in homeopathy are also multi-miasmatic in nature. One of them being prominent at a point of time. So for example, if a patient comes to you with pain and swelling of the knee joint, okay, and you take the symptom like the location you take, pain in the right knee joint, you take a sensation, whatever the patient describes, throbbing, stitching, burning, dull aching, whatever it is, and modalities, aggression motion, better back motion, and Aggregate by squatting, better by sitting, better by heat, better by cold, or whatever it may be there, and then the concomitant. Okay, so now out here you have to identify which miasm is present. So he has been to an orthopedic uh, physician, and the orthopedic physician has basically diagnosed it as early stages of osteoarthritis, in which patient has done in the investigation of extra knee joint, which shows minimal reduction of the joint space. So. Out here, so as I told you, only one miasm is prominent at a point in time. So the patient comes to you with this complaint. So now what is the miasm? Well, as I told you, all diseases are multi-miasmatic. Only one is miasm is prominent at a point in time. So at this point in time, when the patient comes to you, he is in the psychotic stage. Got it? So you have to able to identify the miasm correctly. And also, not only that, but you also have to perceive the direction of miasma activity during homeopathic treatment. So, if you are giving correct homeopathic treatment after taking the full case and the correct medicine is given in the correct repetition, in the correct potency, then what will happen? The swelling will subside, the pain will subside, overall the patient will feel fine. And you know, and if you examine the knee joint, there is no pain, there is no stiffness, and the patient is comfortable. So, now you know that the symptoms have changed. Not only that, even the miasmatic activity has changed. It, is, it was initially in the psychotic level, now it has gone back into the soric level. So if it goes from psychotic to soric, you know that you are on the right track. However, if it goes from psychotic to either tubercular or either separatic miasm, you definitely know that you are on the wrong track. Okay. However, if you do an X-ray, the X-ray will show you the same, that is minimal reduction of the joint space. That is whatever damage has done is done. You have to arrest the disease progress. So you do not expect the X-ray changes to change. So if you're in the right direction, then there's no problem. Your treatment is correct, your medicine is correct. If in the wrong direction, your treatment is not correct. That is what you haven't identified the exact similimum as a result of which the disease has progressed further into the other myosin, that is the tubercular and the separatic mass. So therefore, what you have to do as a physician, you have to carefully perceive the miasmatic sequence of events. Okay, so this shift has to be seen whether it is going from good or whether it is going to the worse. So you have to see the sora, the psychosis, the tubercular and the syphilitic miasm and its direction and how the disease is moving and from where to which miasm it is moving. Now, acute phase. In an acute phase, it is given as number 72. As you all know, it is a sudden onset. It is because of sudden outbreak of latent sora. And symptoms generally are characteristic. 
susceptibility is high, it is easy to find out the remedy and cure takes place in a short span of time. So, in an acute disease, what happens? Dr. Hanneman has said that all of us have latent sora. It lies in the slumbering or in the inactive state or it lies in the latent state. Under favorable environmental influences, when the environmental stressors are constantly bombarding the individual, this, the latent sora or the slope or the sora which was slumbering, which was inactive, which was sleeping, it gets roused into activity and it bursts forth into signs and symptoms. So, when anything comes with great force, naturally you have all symptoms which are characteristic in nature. So, therefore, in an acute case, it is easy to treat. Why? Because there is a sudden outburst of latent sora, symptoms are characteristic, susceptibility is high, you can at once find out the medicine and the cure will take place very fast. So, the, the acute phase. The acute phase can be compared to a volcano. See a volcano, when it is quiet, it is fine, but when it erupts, it erupts with great violence, right or not? And it causes disruption in the surrounding area. So, this violence can be compared to the sudden outbreak, outbreak of latent sora. So, anything which comes out with violence, naturally, susceptibility is high and symptoms are characteristic in nature. In a chronic phase, so given in the same aphorism 72, as compared to an acute, the onset is very slow or insidious and symptoms may vary from characteristic symptoms to common symptoms. It will depend upon the susceptibility, whether it is low or whether it is high. If the susceptibility is low, you will get common symptoms. Susceptibility is high, you will get PQRS or characteristic symptoms. However, it takes a long time to find out the remedy. Why? Because the disease is chronic, is there for so many years, patient may not remember the exact evolutionary sequential march of events or he may forget to tell you certain points and it takes a long time for the patient to decipher exactly what had occurred so many years back. So therefore, as compared to acute, a much longer time is required to take a chronic case and depending upon the pathology, the cure or palliation will take place. And however, if the patient ignores his chronic condition, which is of course very rare, no one will ignore a chronic condition, then naturally if it's left to progress, it will cause death. Now, in on, a, on a reversible level, here the pathology is not advanced or the disease is in the functional level. Susceptibility is good. Symptoms exhibited are uncommon or peculiar and cure will definitely take place. So again, reversibility will depend upon the state of pathology and, uh, and also the state of susceptibility. Irreversible level, after number 74 to 75, here the pathology is advanced or the disease in a structural level susceptibility is variable, depend on what sort of treatment is taken in the past and symptoms also are variable. They, they, they will vary from common symptoms to characteristic symptoms. It depends upon many other factors on what treatment is taken, whether the susceptibility has been suppressed and so on. So, in an irreducible the level, the pathology is highly advanced with gross organ damage and you know cure will definitely not take place. Only palliation can be achieved with the rightly chosen homeopathic drug. So, palliation, the law of palliation, the same as the law of similars. Okay. So, palliation can be obtained with such cases where the pathology is advanced or a cross organ damage is there. Now, a disease may travel from the periphery to center. Here, the disease starts at the periphery and then travels to the center of the body. It means that the disease is present on the skin or a non-vital organ and then travels to more vital organs or the center of the body. So, this occurs when suppression is caused by modern medication and homeopathy physician should treat as per the directions given in suppression. So, basically, for example, you have a skin lesion, the patient applies some ointment that disappears and then after a few months, he develops asthma. So, you know that the disease has traveled from a less important organ to a more important organ and you know that suppression has taken place. Now here I would like to uh, emphasize that suppression, it doesn't mean taking of allopathic medicines. For suppression to take place, please remember there has to be a shift from a less important organ to a more important organ. 
whatever energy is there, that energy will be diverted deeper into the organism. So we cannot say that patient is on allopathic treatment, so therefore it is suppressed. Because in our practice as a homeopathic physician, in our day-to-day -day practice, we get cases coming from the allopathic doctors. It is very rare that you that you will get a straight walk-in where he comes to you for the first time without seeing any other specialist. So that means to say, you will say that every case will be suppressed and every case has to be, has to be given nuts for makeup. So that is the wrong concept of suppression, which I have to tell you. So please remember that suppression, there has to be a shift. The, the disease has to move from the periphery to the center. Then only we can say it is suppression. So the treatment of suppression, I will tell you later on as we move forward. Or the patient may develop some symptoms on the mind as a result of which the body is affected. Aphasia number 225 under mental disease. So mental causes of long standing, which arise from emotional causes such as fear, pride, grief, worries, anxiety, vexation. It makes the inroads of the physical body. Thus the disease travels from the mental plane to the physical plane. So basically in today's 20, 21st century, the stress and strain of modern life is making a toll on all of us especially now in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is extending since last year. And now again, we are seeing a second wave coming up. So we all have our emotions, which are either pent up or which are not exhibited, as a result of which we are in a constant state of fear or fright or worry or anxiety. Now, if this worry, fear, fright or anxiety, if it carries on for a long, long time, it makes its inroad on the physical body. So these are termed as psychosomatic disorder. So constant worry, constant stress, constant grief may give rise to hyperacidity or may give rise to an duodenal ulcer. It may give rise to hypertension. It may give rise to tension headaches. It may give rise to diabetes. It may give rise to thyroid disorders. So your hormonal imbalance also is there and a variety of diseases can be, come, can be termed under the word psychosomatic disorders. And uh, therefore, the causative emotional factor plays an important part in the development of the disease. So as a homeopathic doctor, you must see what is the cause of the disease, whether it was, it was from ailments from fright, fear, fear with anxiety, fright with anxiety, ailments from grief, all this has been given in the, in the repertory ailments from. You can find out all these rubrics in the repertory and see which, which remedies come up and accordingly you have to give. So if you have got a very important causative uh, emotional factor which is respons responsible for the disease, then you have to take it into consideration. And the treatment of the psychosomatic disease is given in organon and the mental disease after number 226. So out here it, it tells you that in, in such psychosomatic diseases, you have to give the patient psychotherapy, you have to give the patient counseling, you have to give the patient confidence saying that he's going to be all right. And not only that, but Hanuman also says that all the mental diseases, they originate from Sora. So in order to, to mitigate it completely, you have to give an antisoric remedy also. Now, less vital organs to more vital organs. It's the same as from periphery to the center, after the number 74 to 76. Here, the disease travels from less important organs to more important organs. And suppression has taken place due to prolonged use of modern medicine and energy is transferred from super level to deep level and life may be endangered. So out here, when the organs are affected from less vital to a more vital organ, why does it occur? This occurs because of the allopathic treatment taken in the past. And there has been a shift from less important organs to the more important organs. As you all know, energy is there which cannot be destroyed. It can only be transferred from one place to the other or it can be transferred from the superficial level to the deeper level. So therefore life also may be endangered. So therefore you have to see basically what you are dealing with and how to deal with. Suppose you get a case of rheumatic fever and patient comes to you with joint pains it is because of the rheumatic fever and you give a remedy. The joint pains disappears and then suddenly the patient feels breathless uh, and if you take a ECG there's a prolonged interval of PR interval on, on ECG and you know that you are in the wrong direction. You have gone from the superficial level to the deep level, less vital organ to the more vital. 
effects. Okay, so this is also of, of importance. So treatment is the same of suppression. So here I will detail to you the the uh, the method of I mean the treatment of suppression. Number one is very important. You have to identify the phenomena now. How will you identify until and unless you are knowledgeable? So if you are a knowledgeable physician, if you have got a good grasp of medicine, organon, and metromedica and repertory, then only you will be able to identify this phenomena. So if you do not identify this phenomena and you go on giving the remit to the patient, the patient will become worse day by day. So the most important thing is to identify that suppression has taken place. Then second important point is that you have to stop the offending agent. Whatever drugs the patient is taking, you have to stop if possible. I understand people who are on anti-diabetic drugs, anti-hypertensive drugs, epileptic drugs, steroid drugs, or hormone replacement therapy. It becomes difficult for us to completely stop it. So in such instances, you have to let the medicine also go on. But if you can stop it, it will be better. So for example, patient is on antibiotics, patient is on antihistaminics, all this you can stop. And then what do we do? Then give a placebo or give an antidote if previous medicine is known or give a universal antidote. Suppose the patient has taken some homeopathic treatment from, the, uh, from some other homeopathic doctor and then he's come to you. So you can request the other doctor to find out what medicine he has been given and if you know the name of the medicine, you can go to the Gibson Miller remedy relationship table and you can then antidote it. Or if you do not know it, then you can directly use the universal antidote like Nux formica, camphor, or coffee fruta. So after giving the placebo, after giving the antidote, what do we do? We call the patient after 10 to 15 days and we retake the case. And when, when once we retake the case out here, now we will get the symptoms. Initially what happens when suppression has taken place, there are very few symptoms or only symptoms which are common in nature. After giving a placebo or an antidote, the case will open up slowly. So the symptoms which were incomplete, they become complete. Symptoms which were hazy, they become well defined. Symptoms which were not seen correctly or which were in the background, now they come forward. So, however, many a times it is quite simple to say theoretically, but in practice, many a times this doesn't happen. Happen In spite of giving the placebo or antidote, still the patient exhibits only common symptoms. It is very difficult for us to treat. So what do we do in such instances? In such instances, you have to take the help of the repertory with the rubric of suppression. So in Kent's repertory, we go to the chapter generalities, Irritability, excessive physical lack of page 1369, which will have a few, it has a few remedies, which is the indirect rubric for suppression, or in BBCR repertory by CM Boker, eruption, discharge, etc., suppressed or non appearing after aggravates, page 1117, and discharge is suppressed or non appearing ambulation, page 1113. So you look up these references in the repertory, and under these rubrics, a few, few names of remedies are given. And from that group, you identify one suitable remedy which may fit the case. I'm saying which may fit the case. So you, are, you have seen that this remedy now is 60% proper and I can give it to the patient. Because you're helpless, you don't have enough symptoms to prescribe on. So whatever, you cannot naturally match the case 100%, but to whatever maximum extent you can match the case, you give it. So you administer the remedy, and once you administer the remedy, what will happen? The energy which was blocked, it opens up, and there will be return of the old symptoms, which appears. So when the symptoms appear, the patient will tell you, doctor, what have you done? These symptoms I had two years back, and again, these symptoms have come, come back. So what have you done? I am very much annoyed. So you have to, or the patient may forget that this is an old symptom. Even if you read Ken's book on second prescription, he had said that whenever symptoms come, ask the first question, have you ever suffered from these symptoms in your life? Okay, so if the patient says yes, you know that you're on the right track. If the patient says no, you know that you're on the wrong track. So the old symptoms appear, the homeopathy physician is happy that 
the suppressive phenomena has been taken out, the block has been removed, and there's a return of the old symptoms. You have to just wait and watch, it will disappear on, it, on its own. So just give some time, it will disappear. However, if not, then a suitable remedy upon symptom similarity should be given, which is of course rarely required. It generally symptoms generally the old symptom will generally disappear on its own because the vital force is capable of tackling such a situation and removing the old symptoms. Very rarely you may require drug to combat it. Now an indisposition. Apple number seven, footnote number three. Kent has called it mimicking disease. Why? Because it mimics a true chronic disease. So the main differentiation from a true chronic disease and an indisposition is that an indisposition, the cause is external and the precipitating factor may make it worse and removal of the external cause will result in the cure. Whereas if it's a true chronic disease, the cause lies internal on removing the precipitating external factor, the cure will not take place and the cure will only take place after you administer the simulimet because the cause lies internal. Because I told you the disease evolves centrifugally from within outwards. So this is how you have to distinguish a true chronic disease from an indisposition. Now, which comes to the prodromal stage. It is derived from the Greek word prodromus, meaning running before. It is an early sign of symptom that often indicates the onset of disease before more specific signs and symptoms develop. And general symptoms and signs of the illness are evident, like maybe fever, swelling, pain, etc. And it is difficult to diagnose the homeopathic rem. So in the prodromal stage, it is just the beginning of the disease. You may not get characteristic symptoms. You may just get very few vague symptoms like not feeling well, feeling under the weather, not getting proper sleep, and, and some slight pain in the abdomen may be that's all. Okay, so again in the prodromal phase, it is very difficult to identify the right remedy. However, if it's an old patient of yours who experiences this, then you, then you already know the constitutional medicine of the patient, you can give it to the patient. However, if a new patient comes, it is difficult. You have to wait and watch until the, the prodromal phase is over and then it comes to the functional phase. Patient may come up to you on the symptomatic level. Here, the disease can be ex uh, is exhibited from a common symptom to a characteristic symptom. Or it may be other also symptoms may be exhibited like keynote symptoms, pathological genital symptoms, negative genital symptoms, concomitant symptoms or whatever it may be. So it depends upon the stage of the disease, whether suppression has taken place or not and the state of susceptibility, whether it has been suppressed or not. Different types of symptoms can be exhibited each having its own peculiarities. So on the symptomatic level, we have got different symptoms and accordingly we have to treat it differently. So, patient presents with keynote symptoms, you have to differently, pathology general, you have to treat differently, concomitant, you have to treat differently. That means what your approach will be different. Treatment will depend upon the type of symptom expressed in order to find the similar. Now, an all dented picture. Well, here we are getting character symptoms at all the levels. Levels meaning what? All levels meaning what? Mental level, physical general level, physical particular level, as also on the pathological level. Susceptibility is robust and no suppressive treatment is taken or in fact no treatment is taken. So again, this is a very rare instance. You know, very rarely a patient will walk to you in your clinic saying that this is the first time I am, I am consulting a doctor. I haven't been to any allopathic physician. And he, and he comes to you and you take the history and you find out that patient has a right-sided renal pain which goes radiates to the right side of the abdomen to the inner part of the thigh and there's difficulty in passing urine there is burning pains the patient screams before passing urine and when he passes urine in the pot he will see the red sand in the urine patient craves for hot food spicy food he likes fish and patient is very dominating he is very aggressive and at the same time, he has anticipatory anxiety. And then, then you do some investigation and you find out that the patient has a right-sided uretic calculi. Okay, so out here, you are seeing the symptoms which are characteristic at which level? At the mental level, physical gender level, physical particular level, as, as also the 
pathological level. That is what the right sided uretic calculi. So, susceptibility was robust, susceptibility was good, susceptibility was high, patient has exhibited has exhibited cactus symptoms and at once you have found out the remedy. So this is occurs when an all down the picture is there when the symptoms are characteristic at all these levels. So in this in this case we can analyze by giving causes more important modalities, modalities are more important than sensation, senses are more important than location, mentals are more important than physical, physical genitals are more important than, than physical particular. The example which I have just stated about lycopodium of right sided renal calculi. Now, obscure picture. Here, obscure meaning what? Where you cannot identify correctly or you cannot see the symptoms clearly. Here they come where either they are incomplete or they are not well defined. So, why does an obscure picture occur? Because the patient has taken excessive treatment or modern treat medicine for a very, very long time or there is suppressive treatment taken. So, if the patient goes on taking antibiotics for 15 days in a month continuously for the last 6-7 months, it goes on like that, then probable the, when he comes to you, the symptoms will be obscure. It will be difficult to prescribe. Why? Because whatever allopathic medicine is going on, the symptom becomes, becomes symptom, patient becomes symptom free for a period of time. And again, it comes up. Moment symptoms come up, again, it takes the antibiotic. Very common example in day-to-day -day practice is the mother comes with the child, saying that my child in the last six months has this cold cough and, the, and, I'm, and I'm giving him either erythromycin or I'm giving amoxicillin. Since the last 15 days, it goes on. And this is a vicious cycle. Every 15 days, I have to give the antibiotics. Otherwise, my child is in a miserable state. Okay. So when he comes to you, again, it becomes difficult. Why? Because the susceptibility has been tempered, it has been obstructed, or the patient is not giving off enough symptoms. So, it becomes difficult to prescribe. So, what do we do? Either you give an antidote or placebo and give some time, let the symptoms again come, come back, take, retake the case and then prescribe. Well, you may just get also a few symptoms or a paucity of symptoms. Episode number 172. Again, very few symptoms are, are exhibited. This is because the vitality is lowered either due to extensive therapy or due to a chronic incurable disease. So, in positive symptoms, naturally, the, since the name suggests positive meaning few or poor symptoms, therefore, you have to see the, the rubric reaction poor under Kent's repertory, under generality, it doesn't give reaction poor. From there, choose one remedy, give it to the patient, the case will open up and the case will again be, uh, it will be taken care of. Now, just the opposite, the maze of symptoms. Out here, a mass of symptoms is there in which the prescriber feels loss. So, you see, the patient tells you an array of symptoms. I'm getting pain in the head, pain in the abdomen, I'm not getting good sleep, my appetite is decreasing, I have, I have, I, have, I am constipated, I get frightful dreams, I, when I sleep, there's saliva dribbling from the mouth, I'm not feeling well, I'm getting headache, I'm also getting dizziness. My, my blood pressure gets low. So, you see, this is a, the patient just goes on telling you n number of symptoms. So, so which symptoms to take, which symptoms to leave out. The prescriber feels loss or the physician feels loss. There's no basically entry point into the case. Patient has taken indiscriminate treatment, suppressive as well as homeopathic. So, as a result of which this, this maze of symptoms come back. And the disease symptom gets mixed up with the side effects of the drug due to faulty treatment. It becomes impossible the junction to find out the indicator remedy of any single remedy. So basically, a major symptom occurs because the patient has taken so much treatment from other doctors, allopathic doctors, ayurvedic doctors, even homeopathic doctors, say grand, grandma remedies, home remedies, naturopathic remedies, and so on and so forth. So basically, he is overdrugged, and because of that, the drugs have their own side effects. The, these side effects are mixed up with the original picture and there's a maze of symptoms with the original picture along with the side effects of the allopathic or whatever medicines he is taking. So it, is, it becomes difficult to distinguish which symptoms are true, which symptoms are false. So thus the totality is not clear. Give a placebo or enter the previous prescription if known or use general antidote or give particularly indicated remedy based on recent symptoms. So, a maze of symptoms are there, either give placebo or an antidote, or a general antidote, or you treat layer by layer. That means what? Whatever symptoms are recent, 
you prescribe a remedy and the symptoms goes up will get ameliorated next symptoms come or next layer comes the next the next remedy comes so in this way for each symptom you are treating layer by layer you will get different remedies so suppose there are 10 layers to the case you will have 10 different remedies okay so this is known as a zigzag method of cure dr hanneman has told that while curing a disease the shortest distance between two points is a straight line so if you can find out the remedy correctly that means you are moving in a straight line and the remedy is perfect however if you cannot find out the perfect remedy due to lack of symptoms then you can treat layer by layer this is known as the zigzag method of treatment so in the zigzag method of treatment cure will take place it will take a long time to take to cure and many remedies will be required for each different layer as compared to the straight line method in which only one remedy is required to cure the case so as time passes the case will become more clear so as in time the the time passes naturally the the side effects of the of the medicines will gradually wean away or if you give an antidote also it will wean away then the true totality will be will become evident and then finally you can prescribe now in one sided disease as in number 173 here there are only one or two principal symptoms are expressed all the symptoms are obscure they belong to class of chronic disease and they are difficult to treat so there are those diseases which only exhibit the one or two characteristic symptoms all the other symptoms are obscure and generally it's a chronic disease and it becomes difficult to treat because only one or two principal symptoms are there so its classification it could be an internal kind or an external kind and the external kind could be physical mental physical further divided into local disease and local uh, maladies and local diseases now treatment of an internal kind that means as dr hanneman said it could be an headache of many years duration or a diarrhea of long standing or a nasal cardiology so the physician cannot perceive the exact accuracy with exact accuracy the disease in its whole extent and whatever medicine he has chosen in the first instance will be only partially similar and later on this will become more evident so the first remedy being a partially similar remedy or a imperfect selection due to limited number of symptoms known it helps us to complete the display of the symptoms so in this way the first remedy will may open up the case the symptoms will come out then you then you find out a second more accurate remedy and you give it to the patient thus dr hanneman says the very striking decided uncommon and peculiar distinctive or characteristic symptoms will be taken into account in order to analyze the disease in its whole extent you should remember that when the new dose of medicine has exhausted action it will no longer be suitable to the case that means what when the first prescription you have given it is no longer being useful or symptoms have been ameliorated there is no further use then what do we do we have to again retake the case and find out the second best medicine and give it until the recovery is complete now treatment of local maladies now there is a slight difference between local maladies and local diseases which i would like to bring to your attention now local maladies are those which have been produced a short time previously by an external lesion and are trivial in nature the cause is external and the vital force does not sympathize with the rest of the body so in local maladies basically what the cause lies external because of some external cause or some lesion is produced and it is produced a short time previously and it is of a trivial in nature this is very important so in such instances for example frost bite chill blain superficial sunburns local applications are admiss are admissible by because the disease is a dynamic a dynamic in nature so this is known as local maladies now in contrast what is the local disease there are those diseases which appear on the external parts of the body the cause lies internal that is miasmatic the vital force sympathizes with the whole body and produces fever etc so the proper case taking is essential and the totality the quality of totality has to be taken into consideration so the local diseases the cause lies internal in the form of the miasm and because there is a danger to some part of the body in order to in order to protect the body or in order to protect the functioning of the body of a certain organ the vital force throws it out onto a non important part of the body like the skin so therefore in such instances you have to give the inter internal medicine only so that the active miasm is annihilated 
and the local disease disappears. And out here, what Hanneman has said, no external applications are allowed. Why? Because the cause lies internal. If you apply an external application, it will be that your lesions will disappear prematurely and the internal cause still remains active and you will not come to know about that. However, he's given an exception to the case like fig warts are there. There you can give local application as well as the internal medicine. Both are advocated. This is the only exception which is given. It is mentioned in the introduction of organon by Samuel Hanneman. Now, treatment of mental diseases is given in 6th edition of organon, aphorism 210 to 230. Of course, you can just read this aphorism because the time is very less. I think so. We will just skip this. Huh? And in alternating disease, it comes to aphorism number 232. You have two different states alternate with each other at different intervals of time. So, the main thing out here is what? You have to identify that this is an alternating disease. Patient will not tell you, doctor, I have an alternating disease, diarrhea with constipation and or facial neuralgia or alternating with, 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 with otitis media and so on and so forth. Okay, so basically you have to identify it. It's very, it's very difficult to identify an alternating disease when the first time the patient visits you. Maybe on the second or third visit, a, a pattern will be visible which may strike you that it is an alternating disease. So identify correctly, treat according to the phase present at that point of time. So suppose you have a case of alternation of diarrhea with constipation. Suppose diarrhea is present, you take the totality of diarrhea and you give the remedy. Second time he comes to constipation, take the totality of constipation and you give the remedy. So Dr. Hanneman says that generally so it is soric in origin and may be complicated with the syphilitic myosin. So initially antisoric medicine is there to take to take care of the soric myosin and later on the syphilitic myosin can be cured with antisyphilitic medicines as per the work on the chronic disease. In intermittent or periodic disease, F number 233, out here, the two same states alternate with each other at fixed intervals of time. So, in, intermi in intermittent, the two states are same, but they alternate at fixed intervals of time. So, they can be either classified into non-febrile type or febrile type. Febrile type, as you know, in organ textbook, he has given the example of ague or the malaria fever. And non-febrile type, you can have dysmenorrhea, you can have bronchial asthma, you can have epilepsy and such instances and treating and of course the treatment is given in FLM 234 to 244. Huh? You can just read that again because lack of time I cannot explain it now. Episodic disease are what? There are those diseases come and go without a regular pattern. You see that they just come in one episode and they go away but they come on recurrent. For example, headaches. So headaches can be of uh, and uh, I mean they could be of, of various varieties. They could be primary headache, they could be secondary headache. It could be tension headache, they could be cluster headache, they could be post-traumatic headache, it could be a sinus headache, or it could be a hormonal headache, you see, and all these symptoms are also different. So, whatever episodes are there of headache occurring, you have to take it and treat it according to whatever symptom is there, according to symptom similarity. And generally, when the episodic diseases are there, they're generally acute, being acute, the symptoms will be characteristic. So, it will be easy, easy for us to find out the similarity and treat the patient. Now, the last point is acute fulminating disease is that it refers to an abrupt severe onset of a disease which may many a time result in death if immediate treatment is not administered. So, that means what is it's a case of an emergency. Example, patient has sudden chest pain and he collapses, okay, and you are called as a homeopathic doctor, all right. So, at that time, do not think of giving homeopathic medicine like opium or camphor or, uh, or uh, maybe um, carbo wedge okay so in such instances you have to know it is an emergency you have to waste no time and transfer the patient to a hospital and you have to admit him in the intensive care unit so fulminant diseases are those diseases which go on on a very rapid onset and before you can say before you can do anything the patient may collapse and patient may die so in such instances on such uh, in such uh, circumstances as a homeopathic doctor we do not have any play in any any role to play we have to refer it to an allopathic physician because of the urgency and the intensity of the complaints in order to save the patient's life so main aim is what not only to cure but also to save the patient's life no no matter it could be with any pathy as long as the patient gets better so in such instances our scope is quite new so finally i would like to give my sincere thanks to the Dean of Powell University of, 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 of Homeopathy, Dr. Desai, sir, 
the principal of Ahmedabad Homeopathic Medical College, Dr. Hina Ravel, Madam, yes, principal, sir. Of, principal of Palo Institute of Homeopathy and Research, Dr. B. P. Panda, sir, principal of Rajkot Homeopathic Medical College, Dr. Mehta, sir, and the nodal officer of Pradul University, Major Bridges, by I hope I'm right, I don't know, and of course, all the other members of Pradul University who have made this webinar a great success. Before I end, I would like to tell you that I have my YouTube channel, Homeopathy Super Session by Dr. Jagos. It is a channel related exclusively to Organon, wherein videos are shot, where it is easy to understand and remember. All the important topics of UG and PG syllabus are given. To till date, I have uploaded 30 videos, important tips, how to crack the examination, even viva questions, theory questions are given. As I've been as an examiner to various, uni to, to various universities, I have taken a summation, or you can say a collection from all the different universities, much more. So please do subscribe to my channel and also please do propagate it by telling other people about the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jago, sir. It was a comprehensive and a brilliant presentation. Now I would invite uh, Dr. Hitat Mehta, sir, to sum up the session. Sir is the principal of Rajkot Homeopathic Medical College as well as the member of Board of Studies, Parul University. Please, Mehta, sir. Um, thank you. Dr. Ina, Madam, uh, sir, it started the Jagos sir has started with the topics of the evolution of the disease in homeopathy and the manifestation of different experiences and its homeopathic management into three compartments. First of all, sir, started with the evolution of the disease in homeopathy. Uh, it is very important topics for the theory as well as the practical perspective, and they nicely correlate with the uh, definition of the disease and life disease as well. You usually always in dynamic nature, dynamic plane, which has to be disturbed. Then person is exposed to the disease. Life is always a flow, hence the life and disease are always flow, flows together. Next, uh, sir, I started with the theory of the susceptibility, sus susceptibility which we flow along with the life and disease. So the uh, started, sir, started with the uh, approach of the health, that is the definition of the health. It is a state of the harmonious functioning that is the mind and body is in balance and working all together means vital for health. Equilibrium means order. Disease means disharmony, disequilibrium, disorder. And uh, uh, health means homeostasis which has been maintained properly. And disease means it has been homeostasis which, which was not maintained properly. In case of the evolution of the disease, the dynamic plane that is preclinical pre-functional level sir nicely quoted the nicely quoted the our wonderful author that is dr prakash vakil and i am the great fan of the prakash vakil i have undergone with the physical diagnosis of prakash vakil tongue and twist of prakash vakil so brilliant photography nicely correlated with the change in state of individual evolution of the disease in plane of the predisposition disposition diathesis disease level of the expression which has been nicely Correlate with the predisposition, which pre means before, dispose means parent, means patient is having predisposition, means inherited uh, capacity, disposition means acquired after birth, theory of the temperament, character, personality, typology, then diathesis, that is exaggerated response to environmental factors. Uh, nicely quoted with the uh, ML Dowdlesser, that is diathesis in terms of the ML Dowdlesser, that is it represents the certain deviation in terms of the susceptibility. Uh, in nut cells, it is the borderline state between the normality and abnormality. So, next is this is lack of ease, absence of ease, expression, that is different pattern of the disease manifestations. Uh, structural changes, that is tissue changes, structural changes, organ affected. Functional changes, that is no tissue change, early manifestation of the disease, then secondary changes, miasmatic changes, with example, nicely explained with the example of the knee pain, that is location, sensation, modality, and concomitant, early changes of the osteoarthritis, that has been correlated with the X-ray minimal reduction of the joint spaces. So psychotic soric, you are on the right track. You have to uh, carefully perspective theory of the miasm. So we have to look for the acute phase, chronic phase, reversible phase, irreversible phase, 
theory of surprise which is present you are not periphery to center mind body with the aphorism quoted aphorism 225 less vital organ to more vital organs aphorism number 74 to 76 so the treatment of in the third compartment that is uh, homeopathic management that is treatment of local disease treatment of mental disease alternative disease identified intermittent disease episodic disease acute fulminating disease so nicely integrated explanation of the different subjects that is practice of medicine materia medica or repertory and uh, it was really a wonderful session sir jo jago jago sir nicely explained the topic in context with the organ subjects which was laid down by the, our uh, dr bk sarkar sir and topic itself is having practical utility and important for clinical practice thank you so much jago sir over to dr ina madam thank you chitta sir for such a critical analysis of the entire session and uh, now i would invite uh, dr panda sir the principal of parul institute of homeopathy and research and the member of board of studies of parul university to propose the vote of thanks over to panda sir please thank you hena madam it's my privilege and i feel proud to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of our faculty i am very much happy that the entire organ has been covered by jagosh sir so the third year and fourth year students what i am thinking before examination nothing to read if they will go through the total ppt they will get everything he covered mental disease he covered intermittent disease local disease to what you expect you will get so really i am very much thankful to at uh, jagosh sir for uh, giving a comprehensive study of organ with afer with correlation of aphorism i am very much thankful to our team because of our team this type of webinar has been successfully conducted and most of the students as well as faculty of different colleges as well as our colleges they are getting benefited that is the credit goes to our dean dr purav desai sir so again and again he is hammering to all of us that you select the uh, uh, speaker and in this week it must be conducted so we all are trying our level best to find out a good speaker by which our uh, all members and students will be benefited i am very much thankful to hina madam so when we when we initiated immediately he she is going to the group and find out a suitable person by which will be benefited again the pain which has been taken my dear colleague dr mehta is great being a uh, faculty of practice of medicine he elaborately and precisely was step wise analyze all the things that has been presented by jagosh sir for us being a organ person i could not able to do that so i i had i had listen one after another each top, each topic each step he, he has been expressed in a uh, good manner in precise manner so again i am thankful our management dr devansu patel sir for giving this platform to conduct such type of webinar uh, series again our director dr uh, komal patel madam always motivating us to conduct such type of webinars our management is always motivating all the faculty faculty is not our faculty so daily near about 30 to 40 uh, webinar is going on by each and faculty for your kind information we have having 13 faculty and regu on regular basis we are conducting such type of webinars again i am thankful to the logistic team bridges bhai jitend bhai for their cooperation and timely Uh, uh timely alerting us that you come and join and start and end so this type of task they are they are uh, uh, they are conducting again i, I am very much thankful all the viewers who are who are uh, uh, joining with us and making this webinar series successful and again i am very much thankful to jago sir and expect such type of cooperation in future also thank you very much thank you very much thank you, thank you sir, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We can now now leave the meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.